afternoon, another Sunday. Another Sunday in Jam Down. When we are Jam Down. And you know, so when a Sunday, what? Only Sunday scoops. Only Sunday scoops. Good afternoon, good afternoon. Welcome to another Sunday scoops. As usual, my name is Big G, and beside me is Mr. B. Mr. B. Yeah, man. And we have the man around at the console, Mr. Nicholas. <coughs> control things and today we have a, a special guest and in fact let me put it in perspective we're having a conversation with Maxine Isis Stone. Maxine has a, had a long and distinguished reputation with, Jama with Jamaican music, um, a Jamaican who emigrated to the United States at a tender age, 11 years old and basically formed her own um, Approaches as far as the culture, the Jamaican culture is concerned. Today we want to uh, invite Maxine to share with us that association that she has had with music, music personalities, culture, and other aspects of Jamaican um, social and entertainment life. Maxine Stowe, welcome. Yes, bless up um, Richard and give thanks for this uh, opportunity to share, you know, my experiences and to hear myself. <laughs> <laughs> I, I learned so much about me, you know, from interchanging with ones and um, subject matters. You know, I put things together. So it's always interesting for me to play back <laughs> these interviews and say, wow, you know, well, so I, I myself am enriched with these encounters. Mm -hmm. Get our insights of our own self, Richard. Yes. <laughs> enriched is 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 operative. Maxine, you've mm -hmm. been involved with Jamaican music in particular. We're gonna touch on a number of areas because what I've observed is that you are richly involved in other aspects of the culture. In fact, I saw something going across the wires. Um, one day last week about Rasta Ganja Global and I am know yeah. you're going to give us a little insight into that as well but um, I just want to get the ball rolling you know, you're, you have been involved with the Jamaican music scene for a while um, how has that been? in fact I saw where you made a comment that we, you know as to why we weren't making any money off of Jamaican music at this stage and you know which sort of one of the things that prompted um bringing you on the show was that particular comment among others um mm -hmm. but let's talk about jamaican music you know its impact its value from your own perspective um well starting with that comment i want to put it in context that right. jamaican music is making a lot of money but we as Jamaicans, particularly in the local Jamaican space, um, the country of Jamaica is not benefiting. Um, so that quote is, is literally, why is Jamaica not benefiting from the huge, you know, yes. industry that it has um, created and still creating, you know, daily. And so... Mm -hmm. Yes, go, go ahead. ahead. You go ahead. No, you go ahead. Sorry. Yes, yeah, so my experience um, for the industry being built in the diaspora, you know, I uniquely understand how and why, you know, the, the, the engine of the Jamaican um, music industry actually exists offshore in the diaspora. You know, first, I guess the first run was in England. Yes, definitely. The companies like Island, Trojan, um, Jetstar, and Blue you know, Beat. Blue yeah. Beat, a host and a host of our artists also migrated, you know, into England. They followed the music there. Followed the music. Well, followed the, the economy because econ you know, yes, it, it was the migration of the Jamaican people and the culture um, left with them, you know. Um, wind rush, you know, we hear a lot about that. Yes. And that migration, like when people ask me, well, how and why the influence of Jamaican music globally, 
I give it to the people first, even before I give it to the artists. You know what I mean? Because it's the Jamaican people settling in these major metropolitan, you know, centers all over the world, U UK, Canada, and um, America. That for me is the basis for our international, you know, um, development. Right. And based on our Jamaican people demand for cu our culture at home, you know, um, this local music industry went international. Um, the only issue that we have is that it's not just the people, but the actual companies um, went abroad, you know, leaving Jamaica without that um, institutional um, development, not just development, but even the inflows of the monies being made, you know, when you're the, um, the headquarters, right. you know, you benefit. But basically the Jamaican headquarters for the music is not in Jamaica, has not, you know? That, you know, that's a very interesting observation. Um, we started this thing, you know, if we go back um, almost 75 years ago that Jamaica got into the business of recorded music. Eh? Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah. you know, looking at it from the perspective as you just expressed it, it speaks volumes because while that was where the thing was incubated, as you said, the head office, the or, decision making, or the business, aspect. yeah, the business aspect of the music never resided in Jamaica. Um, no. And and so you, 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 what you're saying then is that this would have retarded the development as an industry, correct? Yes, r retarded aspects of the development that keep us um, keep us from making that money that I speak about. And you know what I mean? Yeah. Right. You know, because the artists have all grown and potentially benefited, um, but then the reliance is just on them, is what they make that would trickle back in, um, not what companies make, you know, because in, in the industry, the artists make money, but it's the companies that, you know, that really the hold share. of the world. Well, let us look at um red stripe because i think red stripe as a company developed um side and side with the music you know what i mean the liquor mm -hmm. industry um and we can look on marcus garvey drive and see huge um infrastructure you know, infrastructure even if those infrastructure are now being bought out by, by overseas interests efforts, yeah. But the international, the, the, the infrastructure remains in Jamaica, so, yes. in Jamaica, and the beer is still being made there, right. and the benefits is still employing people, and you know, all of that. The music so, has not done you, so. You know, Maxine, listen, um, and I thought we he got we, we looked at the no, business all the, the time. The, the thing that statement resonates with me is that, um. <laughs> The, the, the impact, the economic impact that the music could have brought forth is not being recognized at all. Well, but, but Maxine hits the nail on the head. If you don't have, I'll give you an example. But, well, DNG, the Red Stripe model is the best de descriptor because although the plant is not owned by an overseas interest, you can't take up the plant and carry it with you, right? So and you, you, you brew outside of Jamaica. Right. It's, it's not the same beer. So what it's saying is you have to maintain investment that is in Jamaica. And by maintaining that investment, you have to retain a certain percentage of your, of your income that you generate, or profits rather. You have to plow mm -hmm. it back, and, and which is also building on the value that is resident on the island. We don't have yeah. that in the music. You are, I never looked mm -hmm. at it like that. And you... Uh, yeah. you uh, the other thing, too, that it's... Yes. Go ahead. No, no, it's... You go ahead. Yeah, and the other... You know, I was saying that was why for the last maybe 20 years or more, I've been, you know, focused on the development of a music museum process, not, 
not on a like a museological sense, but mm -hmm. just having a, a entity of scale surrounding the history of the music, wherein you know how the music was made, the fact that the majority of our music in Jamaica and the Caribbean is still owned by our creators, you know. So even though the deals were done um, globally in, you know, Jamaica and the Caribbean was left um, outside of the contracts. So my focus over the years was like collectivize the creators. And, you know, the way the music was made is not necessarily the way the music was traded, you know? Yeah. And so you find that there was an opportunity um, to create a new narrative around the same music you know, and an opportunity for me, which was to not yet realize, which was the international way that the music has developed, you would have given you would have um, given a platform now for the international to to venture with a local, you know, um, platform, especially as how the technology and the distribution and you know how content is now um, as important as right. the music. So that has fueled um, when people say, why is she in Jamaica and why she don't go back to her international success um, platform? It was just that gap and that gap is related to significant people that are um, entrenched in my personal life. Mm -hmm. um, that you know it's my responsibility to you know develop and achieve um the value you know who, who, that the, has not been accorded to them for the listeners out there you know um who would you list just a short list of some of those significant the most person to me is my uncle clement dodd, clement dodd who, right Right, who, um, you know, is definitely the blueprint and the foundation for the music. And even he himself had to um, be in New York for over 30 years. I was there, or more, 40 years probably now. Um, and when he came up into New York, that's how I started in opening and running the Cox and Music City outlet in Brooklyn. That was the same time that... Um, uh, Vincent and Pat Chin Kim, also with, with, um, migrated yeah. into right into uh, Queens, New York, and set up what we now know as VP Records. Right. You know, which is Randy's. You know, old time so, Randy's. Yeah, right. And you know, out of that relationship, you know, um, I met um, Sugar Miner, and initially, you know, I released his first album. Um, Live Loving, um, it was released in Jamaica, but I was overseeing the international release. It was about 1979. And, you know, when we met, I we produced our first album together, Roots Lovers, um, ahead of, uh, you know, establishing a family and, and relationship. And he was just about setting up his Black Roots. Um, Black Roots International. Group. Mute Man promotion. Right. He was just leaving my uncle, gone into England, got his um, uh, hit, um, Good Thing Going, and Lovers Rock. You know, he, he had dominated that genre um, in England. So he was just also, you know, launching out his um, business, his businesses. And then over the years, you know, I've worked with um, uh, the Scatolites, you know, one of the Scatolites members is um, Dizzy Johnny Moore. Right. He is, uh, I, I share four grandchildren with him. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So um, I've been very interested in the Scatolites um, rights, you know, the, that's a whole group of musicians who are not, you know, benefiting their estates etc you know they're not benefiting from the 
foundation that they built and is still being, you know, used. And then the last significant person, I think, would be um, Bonnie Whaler. Bonnie Whaler. Hold that right. thought right there, Maxi, because um, you, 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 you're throwing down some, some serious ball there right now. Um, sugar miner, we want to touch a, a, a little piece of sugar miner, um, just to keep the listeners involved in terms of the music mm -hmm. end, and then we're going to come. Right All right, so I played a good thing going. As Maxine said, that was his first international hit. And then right after that, you heard the title track from the album, Live Loving. Mm -hmm. Maxine, <laughs> what I, I, you know, it's interesting you made a point. Um, the, the good thing going, um, mm -hmm. released in England. Um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, strategically, because that was where the lover's capital, the, the for lovers the, rock lovers rock yeah. capital of the world right 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 and and so you said this song was extremely successful in england on the on the basis of that yes because he was already on the local market um becoming successful coming out of jamaica you know he had just left mr dodd mm -hmm. um practically and was setting up his um labels because even as i was working with him in terms of um releasing his first album with mr dodd i he was also already in the market with his own you know productions i think jammies had a production and um i think maybe black roots album that was licensed to island records at the time and then like i said he he resided a good amount of time in england and mastered the you know that um unique um genre of lovers rock and became a, you know a top artist in england um because that was the first album that we did together had incorporated that hit um the album was roots lovers so it was a album that was created around the success of that and as that was happening then another producer had a track with him, Good Thing Going, Hawkeye. And then that, you know, took off. And then an album um, had to be produced, I think, majoritively in England, if I, you know, if mm. I remember correctly. Um, you know? Who, who that, was he working with in England at the time? Who was the... the, the... RCA, RCA Records had done the deal, oh, you know? RCA. Um, right, right. And... Um, it was an interesting time because Sugar was very reluctant. He was very, um, he liked the success of it, but he was at the time developing his own black roots, you know, youth man promotion um, and saw himself more as a producer and label owner than an artist, you know, it's like the artist was, Taking the artist was to invest right. in his, you know, his label and, and and there was a lot of struggle um to for him to you know uh follow this international um opportunity from my own experience you know we grew, we, this was a period for me you know in in kind of about to leave high school if you will so you're turning into mm -hmm. a you know young adult and, yes. and co connecting with the music i know my contemporaries, my peers at the time, Sugar Miner was the biggest thing, if you, could, if you ask me. Um, mm -hmm. his, his catalog with Coxon was just amazing. Um, and, and not just the catalog, which is the impact of him bringing back some of those Studio One. Right, like, in like that middle, that like the yeah. Vanity Rhythm. The late which years. catapulted um, a Michigan and Smiley. Like Michigan and Smiley and, yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, it's a dancehall genre. I'm actually in the midst of um, creating the platform to celebrate the 50th of dancehall as a genre. And I want to um, come with that. I, I want to... <laughs> I knew he was going to... Yeah. Yeah. No, but it, it, it's significant because I was listening to something recently where Beanie Man, Beanie Man was on a show with another, with a, some other interviewer. And mm -hmm. and they were going. The guy was going on and beat him and literally sh stop him in him tracks and said, "Listen, you can't talk about dancehall in a Jamaica anyway. 
without you talk about sugar man. No yeah, he, he, was, he, was, he was answering in relation to the title being given king of dance -off. Right. And him said he, he the only said king. The king yes. is sugar. Is sugar yeah. man. Him say, <laughs> and him say, what? Mm -hmm. what what sugar man do for dance -off? Because him said when we, you know, other man come and run them out that them a dance all this and thing, but sugar man make dance all. Um right. and in talk he talked about the repurposing of the tracks just like God just mentioned. The, the the studio one tracks getting back into and giving new life to that that seventies, early seventies catalogue of of um Clement Dodd's um work. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and then out of that was born what we do, what we now call the, the modern dance hall. And since you since you went there, you said you are working on this fiftieth anniversary um of Oh, yeah. platform because I've been very focused on the sound system. Yes. And this dance hall genre um uh achievement for him is directly related to his um relationship with the sound system. What the sound system meant for him and did for him in establishing his career. And the reason why it's important um for me to do so is because um, this year, 73, the 50th of hip hop is being celebrated, um, pivoting around Cool Herc. Right. And what he achieved in America um, with there's a party that he had, or a, a series of parties, but a particular date is given as the first um, street party mm -hmm. where the, he, he um, played the sound system coming out of Jamaica and his influence, but the technique that he evolved around the playing of the sound system was a major catalyst. Like it allowed for the rapping, the way that he flipped the records. And it, it also allowed for something significant to happen within the music, you know, like um, break dancing, the way that he flipped the songs. And because of that innovation, um, while there was a, a lot of other cultural realities happening, he is, you know, heralded as the um, innovator, godfather of hip hop. So when I realized that it was the same trajectory of the sound system at the same time, you know, 73 um, was this party and uh, Sugar's first. Uh, release on a rhythm was also in 74 you know it was in the same period so i said wow you know what i mean we because i'm investing a lot in the history of the sound system and the role of the sound system it was important for me to capture you know this um duality especially as dancehall and hip-hop continue to uh, fertilize each other, you know, and obviously going on to fertilize um, genres in, you know, Latin America, Africa, you know, Japan globally. So I wanted to um, both elevate the sound system and also elevate um, sugar and, and locate, you know, because people think dancehall, um, as it has evolved from that time, is you know a certain kind of um performance but it 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 is the the innovation you know is it's a lot of things that are um that allow for the genre to develop the way that it is that's significant to these two people and their relationship with the sound system and it's so funny too because at this time 73 is also the 50th anniversary of the Catch a Fire album and the Burning yes. album. Catch a Fire which album. Is, yeah, is is significant for me in my career, you know, of work with Bunny Whaler and obviously my uncle and you know Island and all of that, and seeing the duality, you know, of our experience. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So as much as we are called reggae music because of 
the ascendancy of the Whalers and Bob Marley, you know, Peter Tosh and Bunny Whaler's solo career, the ascendancy of dance hall also, you know, occurred in the same period. And so you can't call dance hall reggae. You understand what I'm saying? Like I, I, Agreed. There, there is this notion out there that all music that comes from Jamaica yeah, is reggae music. Reggae music. And, and, yeah, and, and nothing is further from the truth. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm glad Maxine that you stated how you stated it with Cool Herc because again there's another misnomer that goes that most people want to take offense to that Jamaicans created hip hop. No. Jamaicans did not create hip hop, but there no. was Cool Herc who was instrumental in the formation of that genre. Very instrumental, because sometimes when you're a catalyst that means there's a lot of things going on, right? But what you do, the particular innovation, and because we are now focused on the value of intellectual property, you understand? Mm -hmm. And what an individual does to an existing um, body of work or existing, you know, pulling certain things together. So you create something, you create something, but it's floating out there. I come in and I do something and then boom, you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. But what I do, my spark is valuable and must be acknowledged and must not be, oh, she never do nothing. You understand what I'm saying? Like, she would, you know, yeah, she never take up what we didn't have. Yeah, it's, a, it's like yeah, a yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, Maxine, hold that thought for a little bit. We're up on a little break. And um, let me just take that break. We were going to be coming right back. Yeah, I'm just squeezing that Michigan and smile, even though that was four years later before, yeah, after. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Maxine, I saw him stay here. He, <laughs> want, he just want to turn the show in a dance hall thing. That's the big problem. Once him start to play Sugar Man, that's the problem we have. You can't yeah. control him. But it just demonstrates the versatility of mm -hmm. of Sugar's um, work and, you know, the, the kind of impact that he has had on the music over the years. You talk about that 50 year. Um, very, very significant, um, specifically to Sugar Miner, though, and, 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 and his own work. Talk to us a little bit more about that dance art project. Before that, but what she just stated was what you call a perfect storm. The Bob Marley, Bob Marley album. albums. The two albums in her. Yeah, Whaler's and, album, not Bob Marley. Yeah, Whaler. the Whaler's album. Oh, Whaler's album. Yeah, we, oh, we need to be very careful. Yes. Was very careful it, with it was the Whalers, not Mali. That right. is correct. The Whalers oh, album, Whalers. Um, Cool Herc, and Sugar Miner. And the Whalers, two albums, because yeah. it was two of them. Burning yeah, and Catch a Fire. Burning, and, and uh, catch a fire. Six months later in 73. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. and which, which for me, though, um, I am a big, I'm a bigger fan of the Burning album than the Catch a Fire album. Yes, um, it has a complete... We're burning brought out the three people more absolutely than the, than the catch certainly of Bunny, for Bunny that was the the launch or the basis and of the his launch Black of his Art career album. right yeah of his Black Art Man album because about three or four songs that were done for Burning migrated into the Black Art Man um, project and he led on those songs if I remember correctly too. yes yeah, exactly yeah. because there was a questioning at that time about what constitutes a group because we're as you know over the years um bunny you know as a vocal group your your value comes from your harmony right your the harmony is the lead you understand yeah yeah so as a as a as a singer uh, in a trio the fact that you carry the harmony at a certain um level and and sound and you know, blend. Mm -hmm. That's what made the group win. So you have a whole era of groups, you know, Jamaican music, American music, you know, English music, UK, was driven by groups. The, the quartets, the trios. Yes. So um, to try to... Hi there. If you enjoy that clip, go on over to our website at yardmedia.com where you can watch the entire broadcast at your leisure. And while you're there... Why don't you check out our other reggae music features? And before you leave, pick up some of our Jamaican reggae merchandise. And hey, don't forget to tell your friends.